uh, chale, uh, everyone, uh, I'm just going to try and solve this paper, uh, which is a uh, question paper, February, March, uh, for the ES exam. This is specifically for the ES exam. Uh, we're going to try and solve this. So February, March, 2021, uh, just very quickly, I have my data booklet opened. Uh, that's with me over here. And uh, so here's my data booklet. Anyways, let's start with the first question. I'm going to try and do a paper each day so that we have a database of papers where, which we can refer to later on. Uh, and most of these uh, uh, past paper practice sessions would be happening later in the evening. Now, uh, starting with the first question, let's start with the first question. It's about, uh, this one is about a Boltzmann distribution that uh, the rate of chemical reactions is affected by changes in temperature and uh, pressure. Draw a curve on the axis to show the Boltzmann distribution of energy of particles in a sample of gaseous krypton atoms at a given temperature and label the curve uh, T1 and label the axis. So what a Boltzmann distribution is, that it gives you the distribution of molecular energies in a container. So let's, for example, we have a container and that container has lots of particles. Uh, so imagine many particles that are gaseous, krypton particles, and they are present in the container. What's going to happen is all these particles would be moving around, bumping around, and they would be losing and gaining energies but uh, most of the particles would be present uh, close to an average energy. So, so there's going to be a low energy and the curve is always going to be ske skewed like this. Uh, there's going to be a low energy end. Uh, at the low energy point, the number of particles having very low energies, that's they're going to be very less. And the number of particles that have a very high energy, uh, so that's our high energy end. So the number of particles having high energy, there would be very few as well. Most of the particles would be close to the average energy. So the peak, where the peak, uh, where the where the curve peaks, that's your uh, that has the greatest number of particles having uh, average number of uh, or the average energy. So for example, if this uh, containers at 25 degrees centigrade, then most of the particles would have energies that are uh, close to 25 degrees centigrade. Very few would have energies that are higher than that. And very few would have energies that are lower than that. Uh, and this axis is the proportion or the number of particles. Uh, the next part is on the diagram, draw a second curve to show the distribution of energies of the krypton atoms at a higher temperature. And we have to label uh, the first curve that we drew, that's T1. Now, T2, if you increase uh, temperature, what happens is that the curve is going to shift forward and it's going to flatten out. It's going to shift to the right and it would flatten out because the average energy now is much higher. You have a higher temperature. If something has a uh, higher temperature, then the particles uh, would have the average energy point would be much higher. Uh, there would be more particles having high energy. So the number of particles over here would increase and there would be fewer particles having low energy. Uh, the next part is the Boltzmann distribution assumes that the particles behave as an ideal gas state. Two assumptions of the kinetic theory as applied to an ideal gas. These are your two main assumptions. Uh, that the intermolecular forces are negligible. That's the first assumption. And the second assumption is, uh, for example, uh, where is a gas? This is a gas container. So gases, they don't have a lot of uh, intermolecular forces, which is why the particles are freely uh, moving around. That's the first assumption. The second assumption is, that if you look at a gas, uh, what happens is that most of the gas uh, or the gas that's occupying the volume that's in the container, most of it is just empty spaces. So the second assumption is that the volume occupied by the gas, or we can write it the other way around, that the volume of the particles
is negligible compared to the total volume occupied by the gas. compared to total volume that's occupied by the gas. What that assumption basically means is that if you have a container, uh, the particles are really tiny. They don't have a lot of volume, but they're occupying a very big volume because most of it is just empty spaces. So that's the second assumption. Then I think it's a it's a it's an idle gas question which you have to solve. Uh, uh, you're given two grams of krypton and it's placed in a five dm cube container at one twenty degrees centigrade. Calculate the pressure in pascals of krypton in the container, assuming krypton behaves as an idle gas. So, so for an idle gas, you have this equation which is PV is equal to nRT, uh, but you have to get the units right. Uh, P is pressure. V is volume. Uh, pressure should be in pascals. Volume should be in uh, in uh, meter cube. Uh, N is moles. R is the gas constant, which you can find in your data booklet. That's 8.31. And temperature should be in Kelvin. So this thing over here should be in Kelvin. So it's going to be 120 plus. Uh, you're going to add 273 to it. So that's your Kelvins. Temperature in Kelvins. This should be in meter cube. So this one over here, if you want to convert dm cube to meter cube, that's going to be 5 and 10 power minus 3 meter cube uh, divided by 1000 and krypton is a gas so you have to convert that into moles and in moles uh, it's going to be 2 divided by the by the ar of krypton which we can have a look at the at the data booklet and we can have a look at the pure table make sure uh, don't use the values that you remember because uh, you have i mean you get scored you get points for uh, accuracy so when you open the pure table you can have a look over here. You've got uh, you've got krypton, and that's it has a mass of eighty three point eight. So you have to be very precise. Uh, this is krypton over here that it has a mass of eighty three point eight. So make sure you use that. So here's our expression, and I'm going to put these values. The pressure has to be calculated. Calculate the pressure. That's that's what we are looking for. So pressure would be moles, which are 2 divided by 83.8 into 8.31 into temperature, which is what? It's uh, 120 plus 273. And the whole thing should be divided by volume. So I'm going to divide this by volume, which is uh, which is 5 times 10 per minus, minus 3. Now you have to be, you've got to be very careful with the calculation. Everything has to be very precise. So let me open a calculator. Uh, make sure, I mean, my calculator doesn't really work that well. So uh, I'll probably, I'm going to probably check the answer in the market scheme. So this is a desktop calculator. I'm going to try and use this one for calculations. So it's going to be uh, use brackets always. So it's going to be two uh, and that's going to be multiplied by uh, 8.31 and let me bring it down so it's going to be multiplied by 8.31 and that's going to be multiplied by again I'm going to put brackets it's going to be multiplied by 120 plus 273 and then uh, brackets close so that's coming out to be 6531 that's that's my numerator uh, 2 times 8.31 times uh, 120 plus 273 so that's uh, so the numerator is what it's six five three one dot six x so six five three one dot double six and then the whole thing is going to be divided by five times ten per minus three so let's uh, find what that is uh so that one is going to be five uh ten per just a second so it's going to be five and one second so five and times 10 per minus three. So let's put 10 per minus three first. So I think I need to minus three and then 10 per X. So minus three, and then I'm gonna put 10 per X and I'm still not getting that. Uh, so I'm gonna try and do this the other way around. It's going to be 8, 83.8. And that would be multiplied by 
uh, what's five times it's point zero zero five double zero five and that gives you minus point it's going to be 83.8 times 5 uh, so it's going to be 0.419 so this is 0.419 and i need to divide both of these things now so if we divide this it's going to be 6531.66 and that's going to be divided by uh, 0 0.419 and that gives me this thing 15588.68715. I mean, I'm going to write the whole thing 15, 588, and uh, 0.687, etc. So you're getting a big value. Now, remember that uh, you have to look at how accurate should be your answer. Uh, if the accuracy that they have given you is two grams, that's uh, 2.00, so you're accurate up to three significant figures. This value is also accurate up to three significant figures. So your answer cannot exceed that accuracy. So what you're going to write is, uh, what you can do is you can convert it into, into kilopascals, it's going to be 15 point. So you're going to round it off to three significant figures, uh, which is going to be one, five, and this one would turn into six, and that's zero, zero pascals. So we're going to quickly have a look at the marking scheme just to see if I've done the calculations properly. Uh, this is the first question. So this, I think, is the marking scheme. So we're getting exactly 15600 pascals. Now you have to be very careful with the with the rounding that you're supposed to do. Make sure you follow because you're, you're going to lose irrelevant marks during that. So make sure that your answer doesn't exceed the accuracy that's given in the values that you're using. Your answer cannot be more accurate than the values that you're using. If it's three significant figures, the answer should not exceed it. I mean, don't write this. You're going to, you're going to lose marks for this. Uh, let's move to the next part of the question, which is, uh, which is still explain the conditions at which Krypton behaves most like an ideal gas. And you have to, I think you have to give an explanation for that as well. So most like an ideal gas, negligible intermolecular forces. When do you, so I'm just going to write points. I'm just going to try and explain that. Uh, so negligible intermolecular forces, when do molecules or gases have negligible intermolecular forces? They have negligible intermolecular forces when they are at a higher temperature. Uh, there's going to be more kinetic energy. If they have more kinetic energy, it would be much easier to overcome those attractive forces and the particles would behave more like a gas. Uh, what's the second assumption? The second assumption is that the particles should have a lot of space. So that's the second assumption that the particle volume should be negligible compared to the volume that's occupied by the entire gas. So the only way uh, you can have the particles really far apart because that's what gases do. The particles are far apart according to kinetic particle theory. You can keep the gas at low pressure. Don't compress it. So uh, the other is uh, uh, gas, uh, gas particle volume. It should be negligible. And that is only true if the gas particles are really far apart. So that happens at lower pressure. At lower pressure, the gases are going to be, the particles are going to be really, really far apart. I said, then you've got uh, part C, and we can also check. It's a two mark question, so it's always better to actually uh, check what they're looking for. Uh, so low pressure and high temperature, that got you one mark, and the second mark was that the volume of the particles is negligible. That is what we wrote, and uh, going to high kinetic energy, the particles, uh, the attractive forces are kind of uh, not, the, are insignificant or they're easily, easier to overcome. So we did write that as well. Uh, let's move on to the next part, which is, I think it's just a simple O-levels uh, uh, energy profile diagram. So Krypton reacts, uh, the activation energy for the reaction is given. The enthalpy change for the reaction is also given. So it's an, if you can, if you have a look, it's an endothermic reaction. And I, I think that they are, looking for this specific reaction. So use this information to complete the reaction profile diagram for the formation of KRF2. 
assuming the reaction proceeds in one step. So it's an endothermic reaction, which clearly you can check from the positive value. So that means your products are going to be at a much higher energy. So you're going to sketch that. The products are going to be at a higher energy. Uh, that's your energy profile diagram. Uh, remember, all arrows are going to start from your reactants. So the first one, this arrow is your delta H. And you can quote the value as well. It's plus 60.2. And then you have to label the activation energy as well. Activation energy starts from the reactants and goes all the way to the top. And that's your activation energy. And you can quote the value as well. I think uh, they did ask you to label EA as well as delta HF. Uh, then explain in terms of activation energy and the collision of particles, how an increase in temperature affects the rate of a chemical reaction. So. Uh, why does a reaction happen? Reactions happen because molecules, they collide. So what happens at a higher temperature? If you take something, if you take a reaction at a higher temperature, you do it at a higher temperature, uh, particles are going to have more kinetic energy. They're going to travel, they're going to have more speed. So they would travel faster. So they, two things would happen. One is they're going to have more frequent collisions. So that's number one. You're going to have more frequent collisions. And due to more kinetic energy, there would also be, there would be more effective collisions as well. They're going to collide with each other a lot more. So more particles would have energy greater than activation energy. will have energy that would be greater than your activation energy, which is EA. I said, let's move on, explain how Cl2 is used for water purification. So, so Cl2 is a disinfectant. I mean, Cl2 reacts with water and produces two substances. One is HCl, the other one is HOCl. And uh, this is a, this is part of inorganic chemistry and it's used as, uh, as a disinfectant. And it's a, it's a strong oxidizing agent, which basically means it gets reduced. Uh, it produces this strong oxidizing agent. It's a strong oxidizing agent gets reduced. So it's a disinfectant, uh, just to be clear, uh, I have some doubts. It's a one mark question, so I don't know what exact one mark they're looking for. So we can have a we can have a quick look. They just wanted to, I mean, that was it. They just wanted to be, it. Uh, I mean, the answer was just kills bacteria. That's it, just one mark. No further information was required. Now, the next part is chlorine has the highest first ionization energy of period three elements, Na2Cl. Construct an equation for the ionization energy of chlorine. So you have a chlorine, remember the state, it's going to be a gaseous atom, one mole of chlorine gaseous atoms, they're going to lose electrons and they would form Cl plus one gaseous ions and one electron would be lost. So you have to be very, very specific. And then you have to talk about the first ionization energies of period three elements. So I think there's a general increase. So we're talking about across the period. I'm just going to Google an image for that. Uh, so ionization energies across a period. So just copy pasting an image just for clarity. So um, let's go with this one. I'm just going to copy this image and I'm going to paste this, paste it there on the paper. So just for better explanation. Now this one, this is probably not the, I don't know if it's the third period, I think. One second. So this one uh, kind of looks, yes, it definitely is the third period. It's uh, NAMGL, etc. They're all part of the third period. Now, remember what happens when you move across the period? Why are the ionization energies increasing across the period? Now, it's a, it's a two-month question, just two points for that. Why do they increase? There's a general increase. Uh, the first one is that when you move across the period, you have the same shells. I mean, it's exactly the same 
shells. Uh, so same shielding. So that's not going to have an effect really. But when you move across the period, you have more more nuclear charge. I mean, you're going to write it like that, that when you move across a period, you have more nuclear charge. And I mean, the first one is not going to have any effect, no effect. Uh, that the outer electron, uh, and I, I can actually go and fetch some uh, atoms in period three. So period three atoms. So hopefully we'll we'll get some PHC atoms. Uh, no, we didn't. Or just the dot and cross diagrams. So anyway, so I'm, I'm just going to draw uh, a PHC atom very, very quickly. So this one. They have the same, uh, the nuclear charge keeps on increasing. You have got, you've got more protons. Plus, another effect is that when you move across the uh, period, because you have the same number of shells, the more protons, the higher number of protons. For example, chlorine, chlorine has 17 protons. Uh, that's a much higher number than the other ones. Sodium just has 11 protons. So sodium is not going to attract its electrons that much. So when you move across the period, not only do you have more nuclear charge, uh, the distance slightly decreases as well. Or we can, instead of writing distance, we can talk about the atomic radius, that the atom kind of becomes smaller. They decrease across the period. So because of these two factors, it becomes, uh, because of the smaller atom, the electrons are closer to the nucleus. And it would be much better if I can have a diagram showing that. So let me just draw uh, sodium and Cl. So sodium has three shells. So that's one. That's my second one. And that's hopefully my third one. And I'm just going to copy that for for Cl. Cl is going to have three shells as well. But in Cl's case, the electrons would be kind of more tightly held together by the by the atom. Why? Because sodium has a lot fewer atoms. Uh, so sodium will have just 11 protons. This is sodium over here. While uh, your other one, so while uh, this one, this is chlorine, that's going to have 17 protons in its nucleus. So the electrons uh, would be a lot tightly held together by chlorine. So sodium will have two in the first eight in the second one, and it's going to have just one. So this electron over here is not is not really going to be attracted that uh, strongly to, to sodium. While in chlorine, uh, because of the greater number of protons, the electrons would be a lot more tightly held together and it's going to be a smaller atom. And the outer electrons would be held by the sodium nucleus a lot stronger. So this is uh, not sodium, this is chlorine actually. So it's going to be it's going to be a lot stronger. The attraction is going to be a lot stronger, uh, which is why when you move across the period, uh, you have more protons. So that's one new, more nuclear charge, and the atomic radius constantly decreases as well. As the next one, uh, you've got your halide ion. Uh, he's, uh, he's saying they show clear trends in the physical and chemical properties. State explain the relative thermal stabilities of the hydrogen halides. So which one? It's thermal stability. We're talking about thermal stability. So we're talking about comparing HCl, HBr, and we are comparing HI. It's a two mark question. Uh, state and explain. So the thermal de stability decreases. Uh, down the group, they're going to be less stable. That's the first statement. You get one marks for that. Uh, why does it become sta uh, unstable? Because remember, smaller atoms they make smaller atoms make smaller uh, make stronger bonds. So, so this is the explanation part. They make stronger bonds. Uh, why do they make stronger bonds? Because when they when they bond, for example, HCl is much smaller compared to HI. Uh, iodine is is a lot bigger compared to the others. 
So scale is much smaller. So that means uh, the atoms would be very, very close together and the attraction for the shared electrons is going to be really strong. So there's going to be a smaller bond length. That's why the attraction is stronger. They would be close together. And there's going to be more orbital overlap as well. So for example, the HCl bond is going, it's going to be very tiny. The Cl atom is much smaller. The HI atoms would be really far away from each other. And because of the greater shielding, they wouldn't be really attracting each other that strongly. So if they're not attracting each other that strongly, then uh, uh, the bond would be a lot weaker. HI is very, un very unstable. It decomposes at room temperature as well. So it's kind of really unstable, uh, which you should know uh, as part of inorganic chemistry. Now, the next part is, uh, they're talking about halodynes react easily with concentrated H2SO4. The main sulfur containing products of each reaction is shown in the table. Uh, you have to figure out the oxidation number of sulfur, so that's kind of easy. Uh, in HSO4, I think that's plus six over here, it's plus four over here, it's, uh, I guess, minus two. Uh, you can, uh, I mean, most of you know how to find oxidation states. Uh, I'll just do one, HSO4 minus one. How do you do that? Uh, all the individual charges must add up to be equal to zero. H is plus one. Sulfur is the unknown. We have no idea what that is. Oxygen is minus two. That's times four. And the total charge must be equal to minus one. You can kind of check whether this is going to come out to be, uh, so it's going to be plus eight and minus two. So it's going to be plus six. That is correct. Complete the table to show the oxidation states. We just did that. Uh, explain why different sulfur containing products are produced when each of these halide ions react with concentrated H2SO4. So just, just one mark. So what happens? Uh, why is sulfur, remember it's H2SO4 where H is plus six. In the first one, no reduction happens with Cl minus one. With Br minus one, it gets reduced. Sulfur gets reduced, and with I minus one, the sulfur gets reduced a lot. So, what does that tell you about I? It tells you that I is a pretty good reducing agent. That is what information that you're going to get from that. So, uh, as you go down the group, or you can just write Cl minus one, Br minus one, and I minus one, and you can just show an arrow and tell them that uh, uh, the reducing power increases. or reducing power increases down the group for halides. Anyways, next one is state, is state what is meant by disproportionation. So that's simple as well. It's uh, it's when the same element gets oxidized as well as, as reduced. So there are plenty of reactions. When the same elements gets oxidized and reduced at the same time. or in a reaction. Uh, next is, why did equation for Cl2 with coal aqueous NOH? So that is something, again, part of inorganic, which you just have to remember. So coal NOH, it's going to be, remember Cl2 reacts differently with coal and with hot NOH. With coal NOH, it's going to be, uh, remember group seven inorganic, it's going to form NaCl, NaClO, plus, it's going to form H2O. Uh, with with concentrated NaOH, it would form, or with hot NaOH, the first one was for cold NaOH. With hot NaOH, it's going to form NaCl. It's going to form NaClO3, which is sodium chlorate 5, and it's going to release a water molecule as well. Uh, you have to balance both equations. Uh, the first one is, I think it's already balanced. You just have to add a 2. So that's the equation they were looking for. Uh, the next one is part E, aluminum reacts with chlorine to form aluminum chloride. Aluminum, draw, uh, now this is Al2Cl6, that's about dimerization. Draw a diagram that clearly uh, shows all the types of bonds present in Al2Cl6. Uh, so clearly shows all the types of bonds that are present. So how would you draw that diagram? Uh, so they're not very clear whether it's going to be a, I'm, I'm going to check, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, uh, take the safe bet and I'm going to try and draw the dot and cross diagrams for this. So for this, there's going to be an AL, 
So that's my AL and uh, there would be three CLs. So let me just make two. So that's another one, that's another one. That's anyways B and there's another one. So I've got, I've got three CLs. So AL is an AL over here and there's an AL on the side. No, not an AL, it's CL. So AL bonds with three CL atoms. So there's an AL in the middle and there's a CL over here and there's a CL over here and there's a CL over here. Uh, AL has three electrons, so it forms three covalent bonds. Uh, and you can also label that. You can label that and tell them that that's a covalent bond. Uh, CL would have six electrons remaining. This CL would have six electrons remaining as well. And the same goes for this CL as well. So that's your AL and your uh, CL. That's all of them are covalent bonds. And what happens is a dimer is formed. A dimer is formed. Uh, there's going to be another molecule. And it's probably going to be an upside. So there's going to be another molecule. And let me rotate this. It's going to be an upside if I can rotate this just a second. Because I am capable of rotating this. So it's going to be an upside down version of the same thing. And uh, that molecule would come in. Uh, and it's going to try and bond with the first molecule. Why? Because aluminium's outer shell is not complete. So it's going to form a data bond. The CL, the two electrons over here, which we can color or would use a different marker for that, uh, maybe a purple one, blue one. So these two electrons of CL, just for clarity, and these two electrons of CL, they would end up forming a dative bond. Uh, so this ALCL3 and that ALCL3, they would eventually bond together. And they would, so this. So there's going to be a data point that's going to be formed. The two electrons over here are coming from uh, Cl to Al, and the two electrons over here are coming from Cl to Al. Al doesn't have a complete octet. Like uh, when Al forms three bonds, its uh, its octet is not complete. Like Al has its outer shell has three electrons. It's going to be three s one, three p x one, three p y one, and three p z three p z zero. So when AL bonds with three chlorines, it attracts electrons in each one of the orbitals. They get completely full, but a completely empty orbital is still present. And that basically ends up forming a dative bond. So you've got an ALCL3 molecule, you've got another ALCL3 molecule, and they both end up forming a dative bond in the middle. Now, uh, I'm not sure if they were looking for a dotting cross diagram or if they were looking for a structural way you could have shown this with an arrow. Uh, you, could, you could kind of be very specific about this, tell them that uh, the circles are for CL electrons and the crosses are for aluminium. For, but for this, we're going to check the market scheme, what they have drawn. Uh, they were looking for arrows, but I think they'll give you marks for this. They weren't very specific. I drew the whole thing. I drew everything in detail. So pretty sure you're going to get marks. You're probably going to get more marks for this. Uh, just be very careful. Where did they asked for they were just asking for a diagram so this should be correct you should get marks for this now describe what you would see when aluminum chloride reacts with water name the type of reaction that occurs so when alcl3 reacts with water now there are a couple of equations for this and uh, again this is inorganic you need to know period three uh, one equation is that is used to be acceptable that was simply that aluminium hydroxide is formed, a precipitate. This is known as a precipitation reaction. And HCl gas is formed. So what you would see, you would see misty white fumes of HCl gas. And you will form, it will form a solid precipitate. So there's going to be a precipitation reaction that would happen when this happens, alcl reacting with H2O. Uh, but the thing is, uh, uh, these days, in the recent marking scheme, they, they, they actually accept a different equation, which is this one. That they say that aluminium ions, ALCL3 dissolves. That's the first step. 
and it becomes aqueous. When it becomes aqueous, the aluminum ions, they get completely surrounded by water molecules. Six of them. This is called a complex ion. I'm just going to explain what happens is that Al3+, plus. imagine it's roaming around in water. Now, water is a polar molecule. So what happens is, what happens is that all the oxygen lone pairs in water, the negative part of water, they get attracted to the, so the lone pairs, they kind of get attracted to the Al3+. Plus. And remember, this is not known as a precipitation reaction. This is known as a hydrolysis. It's, I mean, the type of reaction that they were actually, I think, looking for was hydrolysis. It's a reaction with H2O. Just, so all these water molecules, they come along and they start sticking to aluminum ions. Let's draw all of them. So that's, I mean, there's a water molecule over here as well. And then what happens is, that the H ions are positive. So the aluminum ions are also positive. So the positive and the positive are going to repel each other. So eventually this H would start breaking off. So Al H2O6 is formed, but then eventually that Al H2O6, uh, the H plus one, they start breaking off, leaving the OH ions behind. So it's going to form Al OH3. Three water molecules, let's assume they remain. A solid precipitate is formed. And the H plus one would leave and they would uh, they would eventually bond with the CL ions that were floating around in water and they would form HCl. So let's have a look which specific reaction were they looking for. Uh, most modern marking schemes, the, the recent ones, they, they actually accept this one. But the previous one should also be acceptable. So, so uh, actually they weren't even looking for the equation. It was just that AlCl3 uh, solid appears. Uh, um, misty steamy fumes and the temperature it increases so so you got uh, one mark for this and one mark for any of these so this is what you were getting marks for in this case the next part is a most question now the most questions are then you've got 0 0.02 moles of aluminum Z reacts with excess Cl2 to form 0.2 moles of liquid chloride. Uh, now this question kind of looks uh, difficult. It's There's an element Z. You can remember, I haven't actually, this is the latest exam, I haven't actually ever practiced any of these questions before. Uh, so 0 0.02 moles of an element Z is uh, reacting with Cl2 and they're saying that uh, that a liquid chloride has formed Z ZCl, where N is an integer. ZCl, CLN reacts vigorously with water at room temperature to give an acidic solution and a white solid. So we, uh, so it's forming a liquid chloride. So which ones are liquid chloride? So just the type of bonding structures shown by ZCLN. Uh, now it's definitely covalent, it's a liquid. So definitely the type of bonding would be, would be simple, covalent. And the reason, because if it were ionic, ionic, it's uh, it's probably going to be, uh, it's probably going to be in solid state, not not uh, it's not going to be a liquid chloride. So it's simple covalent. Why? Because it has it has it's got low melting points. That's why. Anyways, the calculate the value of n in ZCl n. Now the equation that I can come up with is that Z reacts with Cl two and it forms. So just hold on a second. Hopefully it's working again. So this one, the only equation I can come up with is that they have told me that I've got, I've got this Z which reacts with Cl2 to form ZCLN. So I'm going to try and balance it in terms of N. So how do, how do I balance it in terms of N? So how many Cl2s would there be? So, uh, I mean, I can take the help of an actual equation. Let's say, uh, let's say I've got Z plus Cl2 and let's say it forms ZCL5. So whatever number that I have over here, the Cl2s 
I mean, if I, if I have five CLs over here, it's going to be 2.5, right? So it's going to be half of that. So if, if I've got N CLs over here, the CL2s would be N by two. I mean, you can you can make an equation and see what ratio would that be. So I can, I mean, if, if it was Z CL4, the amount of CL2 would be half of that. It's going to be two CL2. So you can you can find a relationship, whatever number you've got here, the, the number that, that's going to appear over here, it's going to be divided by two. So that is one thing. We have our equation and we can start using our, or whatever information that they gave us. They told us that there was 0 0.02 moles of element Z. So 0 0.02 moles of this. So that uh, is fine. If they 0 0.02 moles of element Z, then I think there's going to be 0 0.02 moles of this thing as well. Now, uh, and they did tell us that. Uh, and then they're saying uh, the liquid chloride has, they didn't give any information other than that. No information was provided. Uh, this was provided when, okay, this, this is a separate reaction. So what's provided is when excess of silver nitrate is added to the solution, 11.54 grams of AGCL forms. So that's another information that we have. Uh, so he's saying that he added, so let's say we have this now, now he adds silver nitrate to it. So he adds silver nitrate and he says that AGCL is going to be formed. Now, one thing that you can be sure of is that if they are NCLs, the number of AGCLs that are going to be formed are going to be N as well. So that's one ratio that we have. I'm not writing the whole equation, I've just written down the ratio that uh, if ZCLN reacts with silver nitrate to form AGCL, then to balance out the CLs, the NCLs over here, there should be N AGCLs. So what I can do is I can figure out the value of N now. How can I do that? Because uh, they gave me the mass of AGCL. So what I can do is I can find the moles of AGCL. So it's going to be 11.54. Do the working, the moles would be 11.54 divided by uh, whatever the, you can just open the uh, periodic table, uh, AG is going to be somewhere where I can't find AG. Once again, this one, it's 107.9 and CL is 35.5. So be very careful, 107.9 and CL is 35.5. So we're going to be very precise. Uh, make sure everything is done exactly. So it's going to be 11.54. And you're going to divide that by putting brackets and uh, 107 dot 9 plus 35.5 and and what and and you get this one which i have no idea why this is what we're getting uh it's 11.54 as it not divided so it should be it should have been plus so let me do this again it's going to be 11.54 And it's going to be divided by bracket 107.9 and you add 35.5 to it. So anyways, the whole thing is messed up just a second. Let me, let's give it a, give it one more try, 11.54. And you divide by 107.9 plus 35.5. So I'm not sure what's happening. So I'm just going to open my actual physical calculator and forget this desktop calculator. So 11.54 divided by 107.9 and you add plus 35.5. And I get 0 0.08. Uh, so the moles I'm getting is for this, the moles I'm getting are 0 0.0805. So that is the value of N at the moment. Uh, uh, like in the ratio, like this is 0 0.005 moles. Then the moles, uh, that kind of indicates that the CLs I have are 0 0.0. 805 moles or something like 0 0.080. So basically what that means is, now we've gotten some clue with this. 
and that is that I had ZCLN and uh, that ZCLN was 0 0.02 moles. Now, based on that, I figured out that the CLs I have are 0 0.080. I mean, I figured out the value of N, it's 0 0.080 moles. So if I turn them into whole numbers, I know that these many moles have these many CLs. So if I have one ZCLN, so I'm going to just use ratios now. So if I have one ZCLN, uh, one molecule will have, what's the ratio? It's one molecule will have four CLs. So it's going to be ZCL four. So that is uh, going to give me the value of, value of N over here. And we can check that. I think that was the only thing they were looking for. Uh, so I'm just going to repeat what I did over here. Uh, I'm going to just check the market scheme after this. 11.54 uh, grams of AGCL was given. They said that ZCLN reacts with selenitrate to give AGCL. And we figured out the ratio would be that this one molecule is going to produce N AGCLs because they are NCLs. So this is going to be N AGCL. Uh, Based on that, 11.54, that gave me this many moles. So all the CLs are coming from this. So that means this molecule over here is actually producing 0 0.0805 CLs. 0 0.02 produces 0 0.0805. Uh, so that kind of means that one would produce four. So we can, so now what we can do is we can, just quickly check in the marking scheme whether we got the N right or not, or did we do any mistake? Our N is fine, that is four. So that is fine, there's nothing wrong with this. And the surprising thing is that we're still at question number two. So we're not moving really fast. Uh, let's move to the next question, which is G, and this is about free radical substitution. Now in this question, You've got a dichlorobethane is widely used as an organic solvent. Uh, can be prepared by reacting CHT, Cl, and Cl2 at room temperature. The reaction proceeds via several steps. So the first one is initiation, and then the C Cl radicals are produced. These are produced why? Because uh, because of UV light. Ultraviolet light uh, breaks the Cl Cl bond, <coughs> and when that bond is broken, the Cl radicals they start attacking the H. They pull out the H and they form HCl, and you get a you get a CH2Cl radical now, and that then attacks the Cl, tries to bond with it, and I'm going to write this equation because I think down the line they would be asking for this. So this CH2Cl, it becomes CH2Cl2. It pulls a Cl so that its bonds are complete, and a Cl radical is produced again. And the final step is your termination step that any two radicals can kind of join up with each other, any two random radicals. What are, what's a radical? Anything that has unpaired electrons, that doesn't have complete bonds. Uh, give the name of the mechanism for this reaction. So this is known as free radical. The whole thing is known as free radical substitution. Uh, then it says state the essential conditions required for initiation. So that's UV light, that's ultraviolet light, that's one, that one is easy. Give the electronic configuration of Cl. Now that's simply a Cl atom, nothing different than a Cl atom. So a Cl atom is 17 electrons. So 17 electrons is going to be 1s2, 2s2. Uh, it's going to be 2p6 and then there's going to be uh, 3s2 and 3p6 and then you've got, you're going to be 3p5. That's 3p5, so that's your 17 electrons over here. Uh, identify the product uh, labels propagation step two. So we we did do that. I just didn't put a radical sign next to it. So we did do that. And uh, what else? Uh, we did that. Name the type of reaction shown in the final step. Uh, I did call it uh, the the termination step. We did we did label this over there as well. And then you have suggest the identity of another organic molecule that is a product of the reaction of CH3Cl and Cl2 under the same conditions. So under the same conditions, remember that if you have, uh, and he's talking about the organic, so the one that involves carbon. So under the same conditions, 
Remember, in free radical substitutions, when radicals are produced, the radicals could remove any number of H atoms. So another molecule that could be produced could be one with uh, three CLs. It could be another one where all the four CLs, they get uh, substituted. So not only, uh, so the problem with this reaction is going to be <coughs> that free radical substitution reactions are usually uncontrolled. Like you can't really control that the CL radical would remove how many hydrogen atoms. Uh, it's just a wish list that it might remove just one. It could remove any number of hydrogen atoms uh, when free radical substitution happens. So just a quick revision, what happens in free radical substitution? First step is radicals are produced. These radicals in the propagation step, they start attacking the H atoms. Specifically in the propagation step, they attack the H atoms. They join those H atoms with themselves. So HCl is formed and uh, the H atoms are lost. So the carbon does not have complete bonds. It's a radical now. And then this carbon starts uh, attacking the CL just to complete its bond. So in propagation steps, every time a radical keeps on getting produced. Uh, so that's that's the first step and we are done with that. Now, uh, this one is that the PQNR have been found in the atmosphere, one of Saturn's moons, so uh, probably some nitriles, some sort of nitriles. The equation for the complete combustion is shown. So this is the enthalpy change of combustion, I think. Now the enthalpy change of formation of CO2 is minus 384. So they're asking calculate the enthalpy change of formation of P in kilojoules. Of P, what's P? P is this one. This is the first one. So remember that there's a simple formula that you could use, which is the Hess law formula. And that formula is that if you know the enthalpy of formation of this, and the enthalpy of formation of the reactants and the enthalpy of formation of everything in the equation, the products as well. Then the enthalpy change of that particular reaction is given by the enthalpy of formation of the products minus the enthalpy of formation of the reactants. Uh, you can find the enthalpy change this way. Now you already have the answer, that's minus 272036. So in this case, we already have calculated the enthalpy change. What we don't know is, uh, do we know the enthalpy of formation of the product? So I'm gonna write down the products now. The products are CO2, their enthalpy of formation is given, that's minus 384. And that's going to be times four because enthalpy of formation is for one mole. So over here, you've got four moles of carbon dioxide. So it's going to be multiplied by four. And N2, remember enthalpy of formation of elements is always zero. You, you don't form elements, so that's zero. And minus the reactants. What are the reactants? That's C2F, uh, C2 and whatever, C4, N2. So you don't know what the enthalpy, I'm going to take that as X. So this one I'm taking as X. I don't know what that value is. And uh, the other one is O2 again, it's an element. So that's going to be zero. So all you have to do is now make X the subject of the equation. So it's going to be minus 2036. And it's going to be plus 384 times 4. And uh, well, just a second, I've, I've kind of messed up. Not this one. You bring X to the other side, it's going to be minus 384 times 4. plus two zero three six. So I'm hoping that's the right one. And uh, without using a calculator, I'm just going to, uh, that will give me the value of X. So without any calculation, I'm just going to check the market scheme to, uh, to just confirm the expression, which is, which is going to be this one, four times minus 384 and you plus two zero three six. So are we getting the same expression? Uh, we are getting, the same expression. And that's it. Uh, now, one of the products of the complete combustion of P is nitrogen. So it's very unreactive. So why is it unreactive? Uh, two reasons, not just one. One of the reasons is it's, it's got a strong triple bond. So what you can write is, so it's, it's a pretty strong triple bond, uh, high bond energy. It's very hard to actually break this bond. Now, the other reason for that is uh, that it's non-polar 
as well. So it's not going to be attracting other molecules and would be bonding with them. Uh, so that's also not really going to happen. So let's, how much is left? Uh, so we are still two, three pages to go. So we're going to quickly try and finish this so I can have one video on one past paper. Anyways, let's try the next one. The next one is uh, explain what is meant by the term Brosnan Lowry acid. That's it. That's that's simple question. It's a it's a proton acceptor. And I have no idea why uh so Brosnan Lowry acid, that's just a proton acceptor. I don't know why they've given you three lines. Uh, we can just have a quick look at Oh, sorry, it's a, it's it's not an. I got this wrong. This one was a proton donor. I mean, acids. I mean, this is a stupid mistake. It's acids are proton donors. That's it. So they did. So all the three lines. I don't know why they gave you three lines. That's it. Uh, but they gave one mark for partially and not fully ionizing. So we forgot this part. I didn't look at this part. So we had to explain that. So I think we lost probably more than. Uh, we probably lost all the two marks just because of a silly mistake. So weak, uh, it partially or weakly ionizes. So that's another reason for that. Now, ethane and Q all contain triple bonds uh, between two atoms. A triple bond consists of one sigma and two pi bonds. Draw a label diagram to show the formation of one pi bond. So that's just one pi bond. So uh, all you have to do is pi bonds are formed in ethane, right? So pi bonds are formed and in ethane, they've got two pi bonds. What happens is carbon has a p orbital and N also has a p orbital. Both of the p orbitals, they need electrons. They are partially filled. So if they are partially filled, they start to, they start to overlap and they start to share electrons. So that is pi bond. Electron density lies above and below the axis connecting the two nuclei. Now in the ethane case, it's going to be, it's a triple bond. So they're going to be two pi bonds. They didn't ask you to draw the second pi bond because it's kind of more difficult to draw the second one because the second pi bond, I'm just going to have a go, is going to be lying in a different plane. There's going to be another p orbital and there's going to be another p orbital for n. N, remember, has three p orbitals. And these would also start overlapping. So there's going to be overlapping that would be happening in front and behind, behind the carbon and nitrogen bond. That's the sigma bond that's in the middle. And two pi bonds would be formed. So pi bonds are always formed. So this one, the second one wasn't really necessary. You just had to draw one of them. Uh, this just shows electron density above and below the axis connecting, connecting the two. Uh, so overlap of two p orbitals, side on, above and below the plane, that's it. <coughs> now this one, the flow chart. Uh, I think this is polymerization that's happening. The type of reaction shown in reaction one, that's specifically, that's addition polymerization. What happens in addition polymerization that you have two molecules. So I'm just going to draw or show what's going, going on. This one has a C triple bond N. And there's going to be another molecule. So I'm going to just uh, copy paste that one. So that's one. Here's my other one. And we can have another one. So a polymer's thousands of monomers would join up, link up, and they would start uh, bonding with each other. So they're going to start bonding with each other. They're, they're going to start linking up. And the only way that's possible is if the middle bond, double bond changes into a single bond, it becomes saturated. Uh, so that's how this molecule is formed. That's addition polymerization. So the answer to this one is that they are addition polymers. Now draw the structure S of the organic product of reaction number two. So what is reaction number two? That's 
dilute acid and reflux now remember nitriles this thing over here specifically this thing uh nitriles uh they get hydrolyzed and i think they were only looking for the organic product not the other thing that's forming so so nitriles they get hydrolyzed so you're going to get pretty much the same thing it's going to be the same polymer except that the cn would turn into a carboxylic acid that's it so it would remain a polymer except for this one so remember nitriles they change into if you hydrolyze them you you heat them with dilute acids or dilute alkalis they turn into carboxylic acids and if the conditions are alkaline the carboxylic acid salt would be produced instead of the carboxylic acid so draw the structure of s of the organic product reaction to uh, we just did that over here so and name t so i don't know what t is t is uh, uh the adding h2 gas uh when you add h2 gas uh, the double bonds h atoms get attached to the double bonds over here and the h atoms get attached over here this one is propylamine so they were asking you to name this molecule so that's propylamine and t can also be formed by the reaction of cst ch2c with ammonia state the necessary condition for this reaction so again this is halogenoalkanes remember just a quick revision that uh, whenever you have a halogenoalkane you have nucleophilic substitution reactions what happens is this is negative this is positive so nucleophiles they attack the carbon positive and there are three types of nucleophiles they've got oh minus one you've got uh, cn minus one and you've got nh3 and you have to remember the mechanism of the whole thing as well so uh for this time we, we want ammonia so th this is going to be uh, ammonia ethanolic and reflux another acceptable answer would be that you heat with ammonia in a steel tube ammonia gas uh i can just quickly check uh, whether that is acceptable and i think we have so ethanolic or high pressure heat in a sealed container that's uh or heat in a sealed container so those were the conditions the ammonia has to be ethanolic and you're going to reflux uh i did miss one question somewhere so let me just quickly check this one you see i identified two absorptions and the bonds that correspond to these that will appear in the fresh uh, so p and q can be detected in the atmosphere by infrared spectroscopy so what were p and q so q is this thing and p is what i mean it was p was over here somewhere p was okay these are p and q so both of them have triple bonds so they, and both of them have c triple bond n as well so he's saying they can be identified from infra infrared spectroscopy so what you just have to do is uh, open the infrared spectroscopy page and see how they can be detected so here's your infrared spectrum so you can see nitrile c triple bond n so you're going to get a get a weak absorption at 2200 to 2250 that's one and c triple bond c is also there so you're going to get an absorption at 2150 and 2250 as well so these two absorptions are going to identify alkynes and nitriles which you have over here uh and that was probably the answer as well so uh somewhere over here early on you're going to identify c triple bond c and c triple bond n as well you just have to quote those values that's it so let's move on and let's probably move on to the last two couple of pages so we are done with this paper all of it so i think that that's that's the last question he's saying predict the bond angles uh this one remember it's just three pairs of bonds so that's 120 degrees and this one over here that's four pair of bonds that's 109.5 degrees that's going to be tetrahedral so if i identified x and y uh, the next part is hydroxyethyl reacts separately with 2,4 D and pH and with Tolan's reagent. State what you would observe in each reaction. <coughs> so, reaction with 2,4 D and pH. What is 2,4 D and pH reacting with? It's going to react with either ketones or aldehydes. It's going to give a give an orange precipitate with both of them. 
so hydroxyethanol, would it react? Which one is hydroxyethanol? This, I mean, this is hydroxyethanol. So it has an aldehyde, so it's obviously going to react with, it's going to give a positive test. It's got a carbonyl compound. So it's going to give a positive result for that. And that would form an orange PPD. You can remember 214 pH. Tolens, tolens is that between aldehyde and ketones, aldehydes are the ones that get oxidized. I mean, these aldehydes. The ketones, they are resistant to oxidation. They don't get oxidized. So tolens is an oxidizing agent. And because it's an aldehyde, why is it an aldehyde? Because cetyl bond O is right at the end. So it's an aldehyde. It's obviously an aldehyde. So for aldehydes, uh, uh, tolens would form a silver mirror and a black precipitate and a reaction would happen. Oxidation would happen. The aldehyde would turn into a carboxylic acid. So it's also going to form a black precipitate. Uh, then you have hydroxyethanol is converted to ethane dioic acid when it reacts with dichromate 6 ions. State the role of, now you must know that they are oxidizing agents. So they are always helpful and they turn from orange to green when this happens. State and explain any other necessary condition for this reaction to be successful. And I th can just think of two. One is that it must be acidified. And the other one is that it, I mean, you must reflux because the alcohols are very volatile. So they will evaporate. So you, you have to put a condenser on top. That's it. So let's uh, check these answers very quickly. So you have orange precipitate, that's uh, silver mirror, black precipitate, you got that one as well. Oxidizing agent, uh, heat under reflux, that was one. And I think that, so excess, uh, the other one, heat under reflux, I can't really figure out the, the second markets. What were they looking for? You had to explain as well. So, the explain so again it had to be a complete oxidation because uh, what what's going to happen is that an alcohol would turn into an aldehyde first and then turn into a carboxylic acid. So you want to oxidize it completely if you want both of the carbon atoms to turn into carboxylic acids. So for that uh, you had to heat and reflux. To, and the explanation was that you had to. I mean that was the explanation. I mean we we missed the explanation part. Uh, when you're refluxing, nothing can uh, get out of that. I mean, it's the container, nothing could actually be removed from that. So the explanation is uh, for a complete reaction or full oxidation. You don't want anything to escape from the container. So put a condenser on top. So anything that escapes, it condenses back and falls into the container. So for a complete uh, reaction. I said, then uh, I think that's the last part. We've got uh, hydroxyethanol and can be reduced to ethane 1,2-diol as shown. Uh, so there's reduction happening. Uh, use H to represent an atom of hydrogen. Write an equation to show the reduction of hydroxyethanol to this. So I mean, you just have to write an equation for this. So that's kind of easy. It's, uh, I mean, the first one is CH2OH. This one over here. So that's CH2OH and this is uh, CHO. So getting reduced and it would turn into uh, CH2OH and CH2OH. So that's twice. I mean, this is CH2OH and CH2OH. Now, uh, you just need to balance it. Uh, the thing that's not getting balanced is the oxygens because you've got two oxygens over here. And you also have two oxygens over here, so that's fine. You have got uh, three plus four hydrogens over here. Over here, you also have how many hydrogens? You've got you've got one, two, three, four, and five and six. So over here, you've got four hydrogens. So you need two more. So I think that should do the job. It's going to. Uh, you just need two more. Identify a reagent for this reaction. The only thing you're doing is you're reducing an aldehyde. Now you can do that with NABH4 in dry ethanol, in ethanol, uh, or just write NABH4. That should give you the mark. 
and you can also use LALH4, which is kind of a more powerful oxide, a reducing agent. So you could use that as well. Uh, next is CH2OH also forms an alkene when it reacts with cold dilute KMnO4. Uh, it also forms when an alkene A reacts with cold dilute KMnO4. So what is that alkene? Now, an alkene, that alkene is ethene. Because remember this, that when you have an alkene and gets oxidized, and this is cold dilute KMnO4, that means this is mild oxidation. Now, when you when you have mild oxidation, uh, diols are formed. The double bond breaks, and OH ions get added on OH at OH groups get it uh, added to both sides. So, the alkene is going to be simply ethene because this is what we're trying to form a diol and it's a two carbon atom diol it's going to be formed from a two carbon atom alkene so that's going to be a diol so we're done with this paper so probably i think i just lost one or two marks because of silly mistakes uh, there was nothing really special a lot of inorganic just go and revise your organic reactions uh, make sure you watch the crash course videos for AS Organic and hopefully tomorrow we're going to do another paper.